Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Engineering, IIT Guwahati. And what we were discussing, we were discussing about the different properties of the enzyme in the course Enzyme Science and Technology. And in this uh, series of lectures, uh, we so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the basic information about the enzyme, we have discussed about the structure of the enzyme. We have also discussed about how you can be able to design and develop a new enzyme assay and, uh, and we have also discussed how you can be able to study the uh, enzyme substrate or the enzyme inhibitor interactions and lastly we have in the previous module we were discussing about the application of the enzyme uh, for the human welfare. So, in this context, uh, we were uh, discussing about how the enzymes are having the applications in the agriculture, PC cultures, poultry, uh, vaccine development, uh, drug delivery, making the genetically modified organisms, medicines and transgenic animals. So, uh, if you recall, in the previous module, we have covered the two aspects of the enzyme applications. We have discussed about the enzyme application in the food industry and then we have also discussed very briefly about the enzyme application in the medical field, how you can be able to use the enzyme for the diagnostic purpose. In today's lecture, we are going to discuss some more aspects related to the application of the enzyme in the, uh, to the, for the human welfare. So, what you can see here is that the enzymes are actually having the diversified applications. They are actually having the applications in every other field of biotechnology where you are actually supposed to convert a product into a substrate into product or something like that. But what we have chosen the only the four uh, uh, topics. So, uh, application of enzyme in the food industry or enzyme in the medical industry or environment and as well as the enzyme in the genetic engine. Within the medical field, we have discussed about how you can be able to use the different types of enzyme for the diagnostic uh, purposes. So, we have discussed about how you can be able to use the level of different types of enzyme in the serum such as alkaline phosphatase or SGOT, SGPT and all those kind of things and how do you can be able to use that information to predict the damages into the particular type of uh, tissue or organ and based on that you can actually be able to you know uh, diagnose the disease and other kind of things. The other aspect of the enzyme is that where the enzymes are actually going to serve as a target. So, uh, target for uh, you know for inhibitor development. So, these inhibitors uh, would be nothing but the drug molecules right. So, these drugs will actually inhibit the enzyme. These enzymes are uh, catalyzing a particular reaction which are actually uh, disturbing the uh, physiology of the organisms and so on. So, you can actually be able to inhibit this enzyme with the help of a drug. Remember that in the past we have discussed about how you can be able to use the different approaches to design the inhibitors whether it is the traditional approach or the uh, computer added drug design approach whatever the approach could be you can be able to use these approaches to design the uh, inhibitor uh, drug molecule and that drug molecule you can be able to use to inhibit this particular enzyme. The other aspect is that the where the enzyme itself serve as, uh, as, as drug. Okay. So, in some of the cases where you have the genetically uh, deficiency, genetic deficiency of particular enzyme. Okay. So, the, when the organism grow, the requirement of that particular enzyme is very high and in that cases, you may not be able to have the sufficient quantity of that enzyme and that is how you will not be able to convert the substrate into the product and as a result there will be an accumulation of the substrate at one end and there will be a deficiency of the product and that product is actually required for running the metabolisms. So, in that cases you are actually going to take this enzyme as a supplement either you are going to take this uh, enzyme uh, through uh, as a tablet or you are going to take this enzyme as the uh, injections and so on. Classical example is the insulin, right? So, insulin is a 
hormone, right? So it's just work like that way. Okay. So the same way you can actually have the enzyme also. Um, and then we are also going to discuss in today's lecture, we are also going to discuss about the environment role of the enzyme in the environment and genetic engineering. Now let's talk about the application of the enzyme in the medical field. So as I said, you know, we, the enzymes can be used for disease diagnostics or biosensors. They can be able to use for the treatment of the disease, detoxifications, drug metabolisms, hormone regulations and anti-filmatory agents. So as far as the disease diagnosis is concerned, uh, you can actually be able to use the different types of enzymes for the detection purposes. For example, we can use the glucose oxidase or glucose dehydrogenase. These are the two different enzymes what you can actually use and that can be used to detect the diabetes mellitus. You know that the diabetes mellitus is a disease where you are actually going to have the high blood sugar. So sugar means glucose okay so in this particular in the case you are going to use the glucose oxidase or dehydrogenase depending upon the different types of products and you are actually going to detect the compound and uh, the mechanism through which it actually can uh, detects the glucose is that the glucose is actually going to be get converted into the gluconic acid right and uh, it's actually going to generate an uh, electrical signal and that is uh, proportional to the glucose concentrations. So what you are going to have is you are going to have, I'm sure you might have seen some of your older people in your family that how they are actually using the glucose strips detecting the glucose. So that glucose strip what you see in your home, right, that actually has uh, something like this, right? And you have, a, you know, uh, some place here to place the blood, right? And uh, within this, and then you insert this glucose strip into a glucometer, right? And what happens is that when you strip, when you put the uh, blood on or drop of blood onto this, it actually goes inside through a capillary action. And uh, then the glucose is actually, whatever the amount of glucose is present in that particular amount of blood is actually going to be get converted into gluconic acid. And in this process, it is actually going to generate the electrical pulse means it actually going to generate a uh, the current actually and that current is actually going to measured by the glucometer with the help of a meter right uh, and that signal is actually going to be processed by a calibration curve and as a result it is actually going to tell you what is the amount of glucose present right because they have already calibrated the machine with the help of uh, standard glucose solutions and so on so that's how it is actually going to give you the uh, accurate values. Uh, then the second example is the glucose uh, glutamate G-carboxylase. This is also another enzyme which is actually going to use for detection of the neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer disease, uh, Parkinson disease or the epilepsy. And the with the help of the uh, uh, glutamate decarboxylase, you are actually going to detect the level of gamma amino butyric acid. And uh, the mechanism is that the GABA is going to be converted into a periodic sulfide phosphate generating an electrical signal and that is proportional to the GABA concentrations. So mechanism is remain the same as what we have discussed for the glucose except that the uh, enzyme is different and the uh, detection, uh, the analytes is also different. Then we have the cholesterol oxidase. So cholesterol oxidase is an enzyme which is actually going to be used for detection of the two diseases, the atherosclerosis or the hypercholesteremia. So basically, the cholesterol oxidase is going to allow you to detect the cholesterol, right? So it is actually going to allow you to detect the cholesterol, what is present into the particular biological fluid. And how it, uh, can, how it detects, it converts the cholesterol into the cholesterol 4 in own and it generates the electrical signal and that is proportional to the cholesterol concentrations. Then we have the urease and urease is a very, very important enzyme. It is one of the very old enzyme what is being isolated by the scientists and urease is actually going to allow the detection of the compound which is called as urea and when you have a high quantity of urea into the blood, uh, it actually going to give you the detection of the kidney diseases. Okay and uh, how the urease is actually 
uh, work as the uh, diagnostic marker or as a uh, molecule to detect the urea is that it converts the urea into ammonia and carbon dioxide and uh, you can actually be able to con you know the measure the level of ammonia and carbon dioxide and that's how you can be able to measure the level of urea then we have the lactate oxidase so lactate oxidase is actually going to give you the detection of the ischemic myocardium and it actually detects the lactic acid right and uh, the mechanism is working is that it converts the lactate into the pyruvate and in this process it is actually going to detect the lactate amount of lactate present in the biological fluid then we have the tyrosinase tyrosinase is a enzyme which is actually going to uh, help you to detect the uh, genetic disease called phenylcotonuria or pku right and uh, it detects the tyrosine level of tyrosine because uh, when there will be a disturbance of the phenylalanine uh, metabolism it is actually going to accumulate the large quantity of tyrosine so it converts the tyrosine into the dopaquinone and in this process it's actually going to help you to detect the level of tyrosine present in the biological fluid and then we have the acetylcholine sterase acetylcholine sterase is an enzyme which actually helps to detect the acetylcholine level and acetylcholine acetylcholine if you recall it is is a neurotransmitter right so it's a neurotransmitter and if the there will be a depletion or reduction in the level of neurotransmitter it is actually going to uh, disturb the neural the conduction of the neural signal and as a result the person is actually going to have the neural degenerative diseases or it is actually going to indicate is a clear indication that the person is having the brain related actions so that is actually going to help you to detect the alzheimer disease and uh, how it works is that estacholine sterase inhibits the breakdown of the estacholine and leading to the accumulation of a neurotransmitter and a change in electrical conductivity and as a result you can actually be able to measure the level of estacholine now what we are going to do is we are going to also understand that how the enzymes are actually helping to design the different types of drugs right we have taken a couple of diseases uh, against which uh, how the people have actually developed the uh, drug molecules so the first disease what i have taken is actually the cancer okay so before getting into the detail of the cancer and you know how the people are developing the drugs and all that what you have to understand is that the cancer is a disease where you are actually going to have the uncontrolled division of the cell right so this is i have just given an example of what is the normal cell look like and what are the features of the normal cells and what is the feature of the cancer cells uh, then uh, the normal cell have the limited capacity to repair the damaged dna right and as a result it is actually going to undergo the process of apoptosis whereas the cancer cells have the enormous capacity to uh, do the dna repair and as a result it they can be able to overcome all the uh, damages what is happening into the gen genomic content and that's how they are actually going to be survived uh, after the damage happened then uh, the cell death so uh, normal cells actually undergoes a normal cell death which is called as the apoptosis whereas the cancer cells could be able to escape this process and that's how they are immortal and they will be able to grow for the several generations then the level of telomeres so uh, the normal cells have the uh, have the limited telomeres activity and that's how they are actually going to have the loss of the genomic content after every uh, cell, cell cycle division and as a result only they are actually going to undergo to the apoptosis whereas in the case of the cancer cells they have a very high level of telomerase activity which allow them to uh, repair the telomeres and as a result they will be able to go divide indefinitely and form the tumors or the solid mass then the gene mutations so the normal cells are actually having the mutations in uh, rarely have the mutation in genes and that controls the cell growth and the division whereas in the tumor cells they have the mutations in tumor suppressor genes uh, or the oncogenes and which can promote the uncontrolled cell death and growth
so these are the some of the uh, things what we have shown that how the cell cycle is happening and how the different stages of the cell cycle is happening and uh, how the different uh, molecules or the enzymes are participating in these pathways and how the uh, normal cell is getting converted into the cancer cell is that the normal cell is going through the cell division and it is forming the healthy tissue whereas the normal cell when it is going through the genetic changes which means the, when it is going through the mutations and other things it is actually acquiring the uh, the transformic uh, transomogenic uh, phenotype and as a result it is actually going to form the malignant tumor so malignant tumor is also going to be the same cell but it's not going to be functional which means uh, for example if we start with the liver cell for example so if we're talking about the liver cancer right these are the liver cells. These are also liver cells. They will grow and give you a liver, right? They, so these are the hepatocytes actually. They will go and go and divide and then it will give you a liver, right? Whereas in the case of the cancer cells, they will actually be hepatocytes. They will grow. They will not going to give you the liver. They will actually going to give you the tumor. And these tumor cells are actually going to take up the space what is being taken up by the healthy cells and as a result the amount of the uh, amount of the uh, healthy cells is going to be keep reducing over the course of time and as a result at the end it is actually going to start giving the phenotypic changes into the uh, into the human or into the organisms so the cancer cell the major issue with the cancer cell is that they are having these uh, extraordinary uh, growth profiles they are actually going to sustain the different types of uh, damages and at the end the, these cells are not going to perform the normal functions they are actually going to only take up the nutrition and grow right now these are the some of the uh, causes of the age and cancers so you can have the cancers because of the environmental factors you can have the genetic factors, DNA damage, uncontrolled cell growth and proliferation and in the infections. We are not going to discuss each of these aspects because the course is all about the enzymes and the how you can be able to use the enzyme for developing the drug. So, uh, but I have, I have, you know, I have given you in the slides so that you can, if you are interested, you can be able to uh, study some of these aspects and you can be able to follow the content. So, uh, cancer get developed into a human because of the accumulation or because of the even uh, the uh, combination of these factors. It's not like only the environmental factor is going to cause the cancer or genetic factors are going to cause the cancer. It could be a combination which actually will give the equilibrium toward the development of cancer cells. So uh, these are the some of the drug molecules what are being developed. So you can have the alkylating agents, you can have the anti-metabolites, you can have proso isomerase inhibitors, you can have mitotic inhibitors, and then you also have DNM empty inhibitors. So you can have the uh, drugs like alkylating agents. You can have the cyclophosphamide, cisplatinin, and uh, carboxene. So it actually crosslink the DNA to prevent the replication and induce and the target enzyme is the DNA polymerase, right? DNA polymerase, which is the enzyme which is involved in these DNA replication, right? So it is actually going to stop the DNA replication and once the, there will be a stoppage of DNA replications, it is actually going to not allow the cell to grow uh, to grow beyond the S phase. So it will actually, the cells will stuck into the S phase and as a result, they will not be able to complete the cell cycle and ultimately they will actually going to die. Then the anti-metabolites, so you can have an example of 5-fluorouracil, methotrexate and gemtecabellin. It disrupts the DNA synthesis and repair by mimicking the naturally occurring the nucleotides. The enzymes, the target enzyme is thymidated synthase, dihydrofluid reductase and DNA polymerase. Apart from that, you will remember that when we were talking about this, we have also said that SHMT, serine hydroxymethyl transferase. And why I always mention the SHMT because SHMT is an enzyme for which I have, I have solved the structures and uh, I have actually did my thesis on that. So that's why I always mention that although SHMT is not that uh, main target uh, for the 
5 fluoroethylene methyl hexate uh, it synthesizes the nucleotides needed for the dna replications and repair right so it actually blocks the dna synthesis right then we have topoisomerase inhibitors so we can have the adipocytes you can have the doxorubicin you can have inulotecan and it inhibits the activity of topoisomerase which is involved in dna replication and repair so the enzyme is topoisomerase 1 or topoisomerase 2 and release the tension in the dna strands during the application and repair then we have the mitotic inhibitors so paxitersol uh, vincristine and docetaxel and it disrupts the microtubules preventing the proper chromosomal segregations and the target uh, molecule is the tubulin proteins and it forms the microtubules that are required for the proper cell divisions. Then we have DNMT inhibitors. So the, the DNMT inhibitors are going to inhibit the DNA methyl transferase enzyme that adds the methyl group to the DNA and the enzymes are DNAMT1, DNAMT3A, DNAMT3CB and it regulates the gene expression by adding the methyl group to the DNA. Then we have taken another in, uh, example of the drug which is uh, of the diseases where you have the metabolic disorders. Metabolic disorder means the, the diseases which are not been uh, which are where you are actually going to have the disturbance of the metabolites. So metabolism is a process by which the body converts the food into energy, right? So metabolic disorder can occur when there is a problem with the process leading to an inability to properly process certain nutrients or the produce energy. There are many different types of metabolic disorders such as diabetes, phenylketonuria and the galactosomia. Symptoms of the metabolic disorder can vary depending upon the specific condition but may include the fatigue, weakness, weight loss and gain and changes in the appetite. Treatment for metabolic disorder may include the dietary changes, medications and the enzyme replacement therapy. Metabolic disorder can be diagnosed through blood tests, genetic testing and the other kind of diagnostic procedures. So we have taken a few examples. So uh, So we can have the first example, there is a phenylcotonuria. Phenylcotonuria the, in the, is, a, is a genetic disease where you can have the problem of phenylalanine hydroxylase, the enzyme which is responsible for uh, you know, metabolizing the phenylalanine. And uh, the role of this enzyme is that it converts the phenylalanine to tyrosine, right? And as a result, that there will be a tyrosine, tyrosine which is actually going to be utilized. So, low phenylalanine diet what is the therapy therapy is that you take you don't take the phenylalanine because this enzyme is not present right so it will not be able to convert the phenylalanine to tyrosine and as a result that there will be an accumulation of phenylalanine so what you so therapy is that you take the low phenylalanine diet or you tell take the bh4 supplementations or kuan uh, gene therapy in development okay so you can actually there are uh, reports where you can actually be able to have the gene therapy for phenylalanine hydroxylase and that actually also giving the relief to the patients then we have the galactosemia so galactosemia the, the defective enzyme is the galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase and the, uh, the role of the enzyme is that it converts the galactose 1-phosphate to galact glucose 1-phosphate uh, the therapy is that you take the galactose-free diet, monitor the blood glucose levels, calcium, and vitamin D supplementations. Then we have the maple syrup urine disease. So there you have the this particular defective enzyme that called branch change alpha keto acid dehydrogenase complex, and that converts the branch chain amino acid to their corresponding alpha keto acids. Okay. And uh, the therapy is that you take the low protein diets and thiamine supplements and the liver transplants. Then we have the Pompe disease. So the defective enzyme is the acid alpha glucosidase. It breaks down the glycogen to the glucose. And the therapy is that you take the enzyme replacement therapy with the recombinant human alpha glucosidase and gene therapy and the supportive cares. Uh, fabric disease, so the defective enzyme is the alpha-glucosidase, yeah, alpha-galactosidase. It breaks down the 
glycosphingolipids including the gobotriacylceramides or GB3 and the therapy is that the enzyme replacement therapy with the algacetyl alpha or the beta and the chaperonin therapy and the gene therapy. Then we have the Gaucher's disease. So Gaucher's disease is the enzyme which is called the glucocerebrosides and it converts the, it actually breaks down the glucocerebroside, right? And the therapy is that you have the enzyme replacement therapy with the immoglucositase uh, alpha or this particular enzyme and then you have the substrate reduction therapy or the bone marrow replacement. Then we have the cell disease where you have the hexomnitidase A, it breaks down the GM2 glycosides. Remember then we were talking about the lipids, we have discussed some of these lipids. Uh, supportive cares, symptoms management and gene therapy. Then we have also taken the infectious disease. So one of the infectious disease what I have taken is the AIDS or the acquired immunodeficiency syndromes. And the AIDS is a chronic and potentially fatal condition caused by the human immunodeficiency HIV that damages the immune system and leaves the body vulnerable to the life-threatening infections and diseases. Uh, the virus enters the target cell by binding to the CD4 receptors and co-receptors, typically CCR5 or CCSCR4. After the entering in the cell, HIV converts its RNA genome into DNA through the action of enzyme which is called as reverse transcriptase. The viral genome is then integrated into the host genome by an enzyme which is called as integrase. Once integrated, the viral uh, DNA is transcribed and translated into the viral protein including the viral protease. The viral protease cleaves the viral polyproteins into the mature viral genome uh, which then assemble into the new virus particle and released from the cell. Antiviral drugs can target the several of these enzymes involved in the HIV replications including the reverse transcriptase, integrase and protease. By inhibiting the activity of these enzymes, antiretroviral drugs can prevent the virus from replicating and reduce the virus load into the body. While there is a currently no cure for HIV in AIDS, antiviral therapy can help the people living with the virus maintain the healthy immune system and prevent the progression of the disease. So uh, these are the some of the enzymes what you can actually be able to target if you want to uh, target the if you want to treat the uh, the HIV or the AIDS. So you can have the reverse transcriptase. Uh, the reverse transcriptase the uh, you can actually be able to use the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. The examples are zidovudine, limivudine and intricutacabine and it inhibits the replication by blocking the conversion of RNA to DNA. Then we can also use the reverse transcriptase uh, and uh, you can actually be able to use these inhibitors and they inhibit the replication by binding to and alterating the structure of the enzyme. Then you can also target the viral protease. So that viral protease, even you put the protease inhibitors such as the eltanazarine and retinavazir and inhibit the DNA replication, viral replication by blocking the cleavage of the viral polypeptide into the mature viral proteins. Then you can also inhibit the integrase. So integrase is going to be inhibited by the integrase inhibitors. Uh, so these are the examples, right, of the inhibitors. And it inhibits the viral application by blocking the integration of the viral DNA into the host cell genome. Then you also have the GP41. So GP41 is a, you can use the fusion inhibitors and uh, these are the two inhibitors what you can actually be able to use. So these are the two drugs what are circulation and it inhibits the viral applications by blocking the fusion of the viral and the host cell membranes. Then we have the another disease which is called as diabetes. So diabetes is a metabolic disorder uh, characterized by the high blood glucose level resulting from the body's inability to produce or use insulin effectively, right? And uh, we have the several cheesing, several things what you can actually be able to use. So enzymes play a crucial role in the metabolism of glucose and regulation of the blood glucose level in the body. So alpha glucosidase is an enzyme that breaks down the carbohydrate into glucose in the small intestine. Then we have the dipeptidyl peptidase is an enzyme that regulates the insulin secretion by inactivating the 
secretine hormones uh, like GLP-1 and GLGP. Then we have the sodium glucose co-transporters as an enzyme that reabsorbs the glucose into the kidney, increasing the glucose level in the blood. And then we also have the insulin degrading enzyme and it is an enzyme that degrades the insulin into the liver and other tissue. So these are the four enzymes which are actually playing a very crucial role in regulating the blood glucose level. So if you want to develop the drug, you can actually be able to modulate their activities and as a result, they will be able to you can be able to, uh, you know, uh, control the um, blood glucose level. So, if you want to target the alpha glucosidase, uh, you can actually, you know, the role of enzyme is that it's actually going to break down the carbohydrate into glucose in the small intestine and as a result, it is actually going to allow the absorption of the uh, glucose molecule. So, if you use the, uh, the molecules like acrabose or migitol, these are the two inhibitors actually of the uh, alpha glucosidase and it inhibits the alpha glucosidase activity reducing the breakdown of the carbohydrate and delaying the glucose absorption into the small intestine. This means you are indirectly by two, putting these two molecules or uh, you are indirectly disturbing the uh, carbohydrate digestions. Okay? So, you are actually targeting the digestion and as a result, there, there will be no digestion of the carbohydrate into the uh, glucose monomers and the, once the, the carbohydrate is not going to be uh, degraded into the glucose monomer, they will not going to be absorbed into the small intestine. Then we have the dipeptidyl dipeptidase, so it uh, regulates the insulin secretion and uh, you are supposed to increase the you know, so it regulates the insulin secretion by inactivating the uh, harm secreting hormones like the GLP-1 and GIP. So you, what you can do is you can actually be put the uh, these molecules, right? And they will be able to inhibit the DPP-4 activity, increasing the GLP-1 and GP level, and promoting the insulin secretion and the glucose metabolism. Then we have the sodium glucose co-transporters. So it actually allows the reabsorption of the glucose from the uh, urine, right, into the kidney. So you don't want the reabsorption, right? So what you can do is you can just put these inhibitors and they will inhibit the activity of this particular uh, transporter. And as a result, there will be a loss of uh, blood sugar or loss of glucose into the urine. And it actually eventually going to help in reducing the level of sugar. Then we have the insulin degrading enzyme. So insulin degrading enzyme, as the name suggests, it is actually going to degrade the level of insulin into the blood. And it is actually required because it actually controls the level of insulin into the blood. But if the insulin degrading enzyme activity will go up, it is actually going to not have the, it will not allow the sufficient glucose into, uh, sufficient insulin into the blood glucose. So what you can do is you can put the IDE inhibitors and they will inhibit the IDE activity, increasing the insulin level and promoting the glucose regulations. Then we have the glycogen phosphorylase. So glycogen phosphorylase breaks down the glycogen in the liver and muscles to release low glucose, right? So it is actually going to the reverse, right? So if you inhibit this, it is actually going to uh, reverse the thing. So it is actually going to allow more glucose into the form of glycogen and the form of rather than in the form of glucose and as our that it is actually going to reduce the level of glucose into the blood glucose. Then we have the liver cirrhosis. So liver cirrhosis is a, is a, is a disease of the liver where the liver is actually going to have the, so liver cirrhosis could be non-infectious, liver cirrhosis could be infectious. So uh, the, there are so many mechanisms what we are actually going to happen and how the liver cirrhosis is going to affect the human metabolism and all that. But we are not going to discuss that. This is all what we have said and what we are going to give you in terms of you are interested to study about the liver cirrhosis. What we are talking about is the, you know, the enzymes which are target, which are being used to the, in the, as a target in the treatment of the liver diseases. So you can have the different types of MMPs, you can actually, which are going to have the role of the breakdown of the cellular matrix and you can actually be able to use the drug which is called as doxycycline and it inhibits the MMP activity. So once you have the, the, uh, the loss of the MMP activity, it is actually going to help in terms of the liver cirrhosis.
Then we have the TIMPs. So TIMPs are actually the enzyme which are inhibiting the MMP activity. So you can actually be able to use the n style cysteine, NAC, and it increases the TIMP level which inhibits the MMP activity. Then you have the collagen cross-linking enzyme, LOX and LOXL, and that promotes the collagen cross-linking. You can actually be able to use the beta amino uh, propionate nitrile and it inhibits the LOX and LOXL inhibitors. Uh, then we have the glutamate cysteine ligase and you can actually be able to catalyze the rate limiting stem of glutathione synthesis and you can actually be able to put the n style cysteine back and that increases the glutathione level by inhibiting the this enzyme. Then we have the hydrochrome P450 enzymes and it metabolizes the toxin and drugs and you can actually be able to use this particular inhibitors and it inhibits the cytokine production and down regulate the say, to E1 expressions. Then we have the alcohol dehydrogenase and aldehyde dehydrogenase and that metabolizes the alcohol. So you can actually be able to use this particular inhibitor and it inhibits the ADH and activity causing the buildup of the acetaldehyde. Uh, then we have some of the enzymes which are being targeted in the treatment of the neurodegenerative diseases. So we have the estercholine esterase, we have the monamine oxidase, we have the tyrosine uh, hydroxylase, we have the catecholine O-methyl transferase and then we have the gamma amino transferase and the, all these enzymes are being inhibited by the, some of these these inhibitor molecules and the, what the role is that they are actually going to dis, uh, reverse the effect and as a result they are actually going to provide the relief into the uh, disease, um, uh, relief into the disease or they are actually going to reduce the symptoms. Apart from these uh, roles that enzymes are, uh, you know, being used as a target or enzyme being targeted by the different types of drug molecules, enzymes can also be able to have the crucial role in drug metabolism because when the drug, you are taking a drug, it is entering into the bloodstream and from the bloodstream it goes into the liver and from liver it goes to the all over body, right? So when it goes into the liver, the, the primary function of the liver is that it actually going to reduce the level of toxicity of these drugs so that they can be able to get secreted out or excreted out from our body. So there are enzymes which are even involved into the drug metabolisms. So these are the some of the drugs uh, which are involved in, these are the some of the enzymes which are involved into the drug metabolism such as cytochrome B450, UDP glucose transferase, sulfonyl transferase, n acetyl transferase, monamine oxidase and the acetylcholine sterase. Uh, cytochrome B450, it uh, you know, uh, has the oxidation of the drugs leading to the activation or increased photosolubility for the excretions and these are the drugs that are actually been available to inhibit the activity of these enzymes because when they inhibit, they are actually going to have the higher level of drugs into the blood circulations. Uh, then we have the uh, UDP glucose, uh, UD, UGSTs and its conjugation of glucuronic acid to the drugs making them more water soluble for excretions and you can use the estrophenone, morphine and this drug. Then this drug also, so most of these uh, inhibitors are inhibiting the uh, drug metabolism in such a way that the level of drug is going to be more and as a result it is actually going to give you the relief. Apart from that there are enzymes which are involved into the detoxification. So you can have the glutathione as transferase, you can have the adochrome B450, you can have UDP glucuronic transferase, you have the carboxysterase and then you have the sulfosterase and these are the mechanism through which they are actually going to involve into the detoxifications. So this is all about the uh, enzyme applications into the medical field. What we have discussed, we have discussed about the role of enzyme into the infectious diseases. We have discussed about the role of the, in, in the non-infectious diseases. We have discussed about how you can be able to develop the different types of drug molecules and that actually going to inhibit the different, uh, inhibit, uh, different enzymes and that's how they are actually going to uh, work as the you know the therapeutic molecules and that's how they are actually going to block the activity of these enzymes and uh, how you can be able to use 
these inhibitors uh, to reverse the effects and that's how you can be able to cure the disease. So, with this, I would like to conclude my lecture here. In our subsequent lecture, we are going to discuss more about the enzyme applications into the uh, how you can be able to use the enzymes for modulating or controlling the activities of the environmental changes. So, with this, I would like to conclude my lecture here. Thank you. Mm -hmm.